So I'm going to get us started and just welcome you again. We're very happy to have you here to join us. My name is Amy Blackshaw, and I am the Behavioral Health Project Director at the California School-Based Health Alliance. Thank you so much for joining us. So today in our webinar, we will be recording it and we will be sharing out all of the information that you hear today, the slide deck, the recording, the links. So just feel free to know that you don't have to capture everything during our time together that you'll have all these resources to look back on. We also, yes, as I said, we're recording. If you're having any audio problems, go back to your invitation and you can use the dial-in link and that might help. Um, so let me first start just by giving you a brief background about the California School-Based Health Alliance. If you're not familiar with us, we are the statewide nonprofit organization in California. And our mission is really to improve the health and academic success of children and youth by advancing school-based health services. So we do this in a, a number of different ways. We convene trainings, webinars, workshops, learning communities. We share out best practices. We identify and uplift experts in the field. We host an annual conference for school health champions across the state. This year we'll be convening in Anaheim in April of 2025. We offer lots of written tools and guides to help guide and build capacity of organizations, schools, school districts, um, and other folks to bring more health services into schools and to support the growth and expansion of school-based health centers and wellness centers in California. Lots and lots of resources are available to you on our website. They are all free. We want to spread them widely. Um, there's tools and guides and resources. Please take a look. And if you're not a member of CSHA, we highly encourage your organization to become a member, especially if you have a school-based health center, if you plan to open a school-based health center or a wellness center, or you plan to attend our conference. The membership provides discounts for the conference as well as extra technical assistance. So we're gonna dive right into the meat of our webinar. Um, I'm gonna start um, by, by introducing our main presenter, Dr. Mackay Owen. But first, let me just tell you a little bit about him. Dr. Owen is based in the Sacramento area. He serves as co-principal investigator and senior director of clinical and academic programs and health equity at UCAN. UCAN is UCLA, UCSF, ACEs Aware Family Resilience Network. It's quite a mouthful. Dr. Owen was an assistant clinical professor in the Department of Pedi Pediatrics at UC Davis. He earned his MD at UCSF completed his pediatric residency at UC Davis and a fellowship in community and societal pediatrics at the University of Florida. He most recently completed a fellowship in health equity leadership at Yale University. So we're so pleased to have Dr. Owen here to share his expertise on ACEs and um, I'm gonna pass it over to you, Dr. Owen. Thank you, Amy. And I am uh, so excited to be here. Thank you for the introduction. Um, I think in addition uh, to what you mentioned, uh, I was also had the opportunity to be a medical director um, at a school-based health center uh, when I was based in Florida and really loved the time that I spent at the school-based health center and the connection that I was able to, to make uh, with the uh, teenagers there and, and the follow-up that we had. And school-based health centers hold a special place in my heart. So really excited to be with you all uh, here today. And today I want to talk about, I give a little bit of background around adverse childhood experiences or ACEs and toxic stress and talk a little bit about California's ACEs Aware initiative and our recommendations around ACE screening and response in clinical settings. So we'll start just by defining some terms and talking about adverse childhood experiences or ACEs. And so when we refer to ACEs, we are talking about the, these 10 categories of adversities in these three domains experienced before age 18. And we recognize there's a, a lot of other adversities that a child may experience uh, during their childhood. 
So it's important to point out that these uh, 10 categories in these three domains, abuse, neglect, and household challenges, came from the landmark study from Kaiser and the CDC in 1998 and studied over 17,000 patients and found a lot of associations uh, between these particular adversities uh, and a number of poor health and well-being and social outcomes, uh, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Next slide. And ACEs are incredibly common. Uh, so in, in California, youth ages 0 to 17, about, 30, about a third have experienced at least one ACE. And about 4% have experienced four or more ACEs. And we'll talk about why that uh, number is important a little bit later as well. Next slide. And ACEs dramatically increase the risk, risk for nine out of the 10 leading causes of death in the United States. So here's the leading causes of death in the United States in uh, 2022. And on the right here is the odds ratio of when you have four or more ACEs relative to no ACEs. And again, going back to why these four ACEs are important. So we see that uh, for those with four or more ACEs, they have twice the odds of having heart disease than those with none. Uh, same for similar to cancer. Um, for Alzheimer's disease, almost five times the odd and so on as seen in the slide. And here in the slide, we have COVID-19. Um, but interestingly, there's data that's coming out uh, now that's showing that those with four or more ACEs had increased morbidity and mortality for COVID-19 as well. So if we look at this slide, there's a couple of things that um, really want to highlight or point out here. And so the first is uh, many of the things that are on this list um, in terms of causes of death are really adult health outcomes. Uh, and we recognize that and we'll talk about that in a bit in, in the next slide. But the other thing that we really wanna point out in this slide is that oftentimes when we think about ACEs or we think about toxic stress, that there's a focus on mental and behavioral health issues. And absolutely there are strong associations uh, between ACEs and a host of uh, poor mental health outcomes or behavioral health outcomes. But really looking here to show that ACEs are having a, a impact on our phys physical health as well. And we'll talk about that throughout today's talk. Next slide. <clears throat> So the previous slide really highlighted uh, the risk, the association between ACEs and some adult health outcomes and some of the leading causes, causes of death in the United States. But just to point out that there are strong associations between ACEs and a number of health and well-being outcomes in pediatrics. So we know that uh, youth who experience four or more ACEs have higher prevalence of things like asthma and allergies, um, headaches, overweight and obesity, on the right column here, aggression, ADHD, depression, and anxiety. And for me, this is my clinical practice, uh, is very much what I've experienced in clinical settings as well. So I used to practice in school-based health centers, but I currently work in a youth detention facility. And in my previous work, I had a clinic that was for youth that were in foster care and youth who were coming home from secure detention. And back then, and also today in my clinical, in my clinical setting, it's pretty common to see a young person um, that may have asthma, obesity, ADHD, some depression, anxiety, and conduct disorders, some problems sleeping, some problems with school, uh, a whole host of medical and, and social uh, problems. And how I was trained traditionally is I think we take these conditions and we treat them one by one. So we may give albuterol or inhaled steroid, uh, an inhaled steroid for asthma, uh, we may give a stimulant for ADHD. Uh, we may treat headache with a headache journal or ibuprofen or some other medications. Um, but when I was trained, which wasn't that long ago, we really were not thinking about uh, or trained to think about toxic stress physiology. So understanding the impact of trauma on young people and the association between trauma and poor health outcomes and understanding that link of toxic stress physiology. And that's really one of the things that ACEs Aware is about is helping to educate and train clinical providers in understanding the impact of ACEs, but also understanding toxic stress physiology and its impact on the health and well being of children, adolescents, adults, and families, and sharpening our skills on how to identify and respond to risk of toxic stress in clinical settings. <clears throat> so, in this slide and the previous slide, we highlighted how ACEs are associated with nine of the 10 leading causes of death but also how ACEs are associated with the poor outcomes listed on this slide. But we recognize that it's not just ACEs. Next slide.
There are a number of additional risk factors for toxic stress, in addition to the 10 ACE categories, which we talked about earlier. So things like community or school violence, discrimination, housing instability, food insecurity, separation from a parent or caregiver, living with a parent with a serious physical illness or disability, having a parent or caregiver who died, a whole host of other factors may also be additional risk factors for toxic stress. Next slide. In addition to those risk factors that were listed there and others, we also recognize the importance of protective factors. So protective factors can be things like supportive relationships, uh, supportive environments, community resources, um, which are extrinsic factors, extrinsic factors, excuse me, or it can be intrinsic factors, things like curiosity and learning, ability to pay attention, inherent ability to regulate uh, emotions. And so we know that both additional risk factors and the presence or absence of protective factors uh, can also be risk factors or protective factors for toxic stress as well. Next slide. <clears throat> so we recognize it's not just about ACEs, it's not just about additional risk factors for toxic stress, or just about the, about the presence or absence of protective factors, but rather it's the cumulative balance. It's about the balance between negative experiences and not just the number of negative experiences, but the timing that you experience them in childhood, the, sever the severity and the frequency, and also about positive experiences. And the same for those, the timing, the frequency, how strong they were. And really understanding that it's not just the presence or absence or ACEs, but when we take, take a look at the comprehensive picture, it's about the balance of these factors and how they shape the health and well being of children, adolescents, and families. <clears throat> Next slide. And also, I just wanted to mention that while ACEs affect all communities, we know that there are notable differences in the prevalence of ACEs and ACE associated negative health outcomes for people who are women, low income, LGBTQ, Black. Latinx, Indigenous, and other people of and other people of color. So we know that, and also know that there are significant disparities um, in health outcomes by education, income, race, and other uh, other factors. And discrimination experienced by these various groups, including racism, is also a risk factor for toxic stress. So we know that ACEs and health disparities co-occur, and that many of the structural factors that shape these health disparities also can make it more likely that someone experiences ACEs and the negative impacts of toxic stress. Next slide. <clears throat> so I know for uh, many, many of us that this conversation can be um, somewhat overwhelming. And so in a minute, we'll talk about some of the, the, the response uh, to ACEs and toxic stress. But before we do that, we need to pause and talk about the biology of adversity. So how, how does someone, when they experience ACEs or other forms of trauma or lack of protective, protective factors, how is this associated with poor health outcomes in childhood and throughout the life course? And importantly, how are, how are these association, how are ACEs associated with poor mental and behavioral health outcomes in addition to the physical health outcomes that we talked about um, earlier? Next slide. And I could spend a lot of time um, talking about the biology of adversity uh, and how ACEs translate to poor health outcomes, um, but I really like this graphic. And so at the top here, we have early life adversity and we see protective factors here. So the presence of protective factors can be a buffering um, of, uh, of early life adversity and the absence of protective factors could predispose to this chronic uh, stress dysregulation. And we also have predisposing vulnerability which means that for some people, everybody may respond to different forms of trauma differently. Um, it, matters, it matters when you experience the traumas, how frequently, how severe, and what your predisposing vulnerability might be. But all of these things can come together. And so early life adversity in the absence of these protective factors with some potential predisposing vulnerability can lead to a chronic dysregulation of our stress response system. And this stress response, is, this chronic dysregulation can impact our neurological system, our immune system, and our endocrine system, and even can affect our genetics through uh, epigenetics and having the, the, the associations that are listed here on this slide. So here we can see that this chronic dysregulation can impact really all of our regulatory systems 
And that's why ACEs can be associated with not just the mental and the behavioral health outcomes, um, but also the physical health outcomes. Uh, next slide. And again, this information we understand, I think could be overwhelming. And so we wanna make sure that uh, we're communicating to you, but also to our patients when we see them in clinic, that just because you have experienced ACEs doesn't mean that you're going to have the poor outcomes that we listed uh, earlier in adulthood, or that you as a young person will experience the uh, pediatric health conditions and behavioral health, mental health, physical health conditions that we listed earlier. Um, they're not ACEs are not our destiny. There's a lot that we can do to disrupt the transmit the transmission of ACEs and toxic stress. And we wanna talk a little bit here today about what we do in the clinical setting. Next slide. So I wanna talk about the ACEs Aware Initiative, which is the first in the nation effort to promote early detection and intervention to mitigate the health and societal impacts of ACEs and toxic stress. ACEs Aware was launched in 2019 and it's funded through the California Department of Healthcare Services. And it's a collaborative effort between California Department of Healthcare Services and the Office of the California Surgeon General. <clears throat> Next slide. And so ACEs Aware is not just about ACE screening. There's a lot of other things that uh, ACEs Aware does and a lot of things that we do. And so here's kind of a, a broad overview of the goals and objectives of the ACEs Aware initiative. So first we do a lot of work to raise awareness uh, so we train and expand awareness among Medi-Cal providers and community-based organizations on how to screen and respond to ACEs. We do a lot of work to support practice change. So for clinics um, that might be thinking about piloting an ACE screening initiative, helping them to think about how to do that and providing coaching um, and technical assistance when requested. And we support the development of trauma-informed networks of care. So how can we strengthen uh, the capacity of community-based organizations to recognize and respond to ACEs and toxic stress, and also strengthen the connection uh, between primary care medical homes and community-based organizations so that they're working together in a more streamlined way uh, to connect uh, patients and clients uh, to different service providers. Uh, next, next slide. <laughs> And one of the foundational principles of the ACEs Aware initiative, and I think what makes the ACEs Aware unique, is this idea that toxic stress is a medical condition that's amenable to treatment. And this is why we do a lot of work in training and doing outreach to primary care providers, um, because we believe that toxic stress is a medical condition and clinical intervention can help to improve outcomes. And so intervention in children and adolescents can improve neurologic, endocrine, metabolic, and immune system development. And intervention in children, adolescents, and adults can improve physical health, mental health. It, may help, it, it can help improve ACE-associated health conditions, such as the one we described earlier. And also it can prevent transmission of the toxic stress response to others in future generations. Next slide. Whoops. So since toxic stress is a medical condition that is amenable to treatment, a lot of the work that we do focuses on ACE screening and clinical response. And so we often get a lot of questions about how to screen for ACEs, why we're screening for ACEs, how to screen for ACEs. And so I wanted to talk briefly about that today. I'm not going to go over all the nuts and bolts of how we recommend implementing an ACE screening and response initiative or what screening tools we use, or get into depth and details about how to screen for ACEs, happy to do that for um, those who may be interested, but wanted to give a high level overview of what we recommend in terms of screening for ACEs and the different elements. And so the first is the purpose of ACE screening as recommended by ACEs Aware is really to determine a patient's clinical risk for toxic stress. So we're using ACEs as a proxy to identify risk of toxic stress with the goal of helping to guide an appropriately tailored treatment and follow-up plan to mitigate the toxic stress response when it's there. And for ACEs aware, the elements of an ACE screening are listed here. So a complete ACE screening involves understanding a, a patient's exposure to adversity. And for us, that's the ACE score. Also understanding clinical manifestations of toxic stress. So the presence or absence of ACE-associated health conditions. And three, the presence of protective factors. 
And I kind of want to give some more detail here about why our recommendations um, are like this. So when screening for ACEs, uh, we may have a child that has four ACEs. And when ACEs aware, we would say that that child is at high risk for toxic stress. And we want to supplement their usual care with evidence-based strategies to mitigate the toxic stress response. But also we may have a child that has one ACE and an associated health condition and an ACE associated health condition. And so we recognize that for some youth, they may experience the same form of trauma repeatedly or one form of trauma uh, may be severe enough or happened at a critical time in which it set off a child's toxic stress response. And we consider that person um, also at increased risk of having toxic stress response. So I think the take home point here that we want to make is that when screening for ACEs, it's not just the number of ACEs that we're looking for, but we're also looking for symptoms. Is this person impacted by toxic stress physiology? And we're also looking to assess protective factors. Does this person have protective factors in place uh, in their life that may be able to mitigate the risk of, of toxic stress or mitigate the toxic stress physiology if they are experiencing it? <clears throat> Next slide. And also, we recognize that it is really important how you do a screening in the clinical setting. So first and foremost, we always want to follow trauma-informed principles, such as establishing trust, safety, and collaborative decision-making. And also, there is a lot of pre-work uh, that we recommend clinics do before screening for ACEs. So if you don't have a lot of experience um, thinking about ACEs or toxic stress or screening for ACEs or communicating to clients, patients, or families, around trauma or toxic stress physiology, kind of we recommend starting uh, with an exercise that can help your clinic understand the impact, doing a number of trainings and piloting screening. And so we really wanna be mindful about what we're recommending when we're starting a screening. And if you're in a school-based health center or a clinic and you're starting to do it and you're, you're interested in doing it, but you kind of don't know how, um, or you want some more guidance about how to get started, uh, then you're in the right place today and we'd love to work with you. Next slide. And just a common uh, question also that we get around A screening and response is, well, what do we do with a positive A screening, right? I have a patient in my clinic that is impacted by ACEs. I suspect toxic stress physiology. Um, and what do we do? And so I think this is a broad model of what ACE is aware, uh, what our recommendations are, one, what our recommendations are. So first we wanna to work to prevent and address ACEs and other stressors. Um, but two, we wanna treat toxic stress physiology. So when we think a child or an adolescent uh, may be at risk of toxic stress, we wanna help them address the internal stress response, that chronic dysregulation of the stress response system and hope that that can help improve their long-term health and well-being, ultimately. And before I talk about kind of what that looks like specifically uh, in clinical settings, I can just say this from my own work, both at uh, Juvenile Hall where I practice now, where I practice before both in school-based health centers um, and other clinics that in my career, I've very often been taking care of patients who have been impacted by ACEs and toxic stress and other forms of trauma. And when I first started screening for ACEs and started thinking about how to do this work, you know, I really didn't have the language that I have now or didn't think about necessarily treating the toxic stress physiology. But one of the things that I recognize is that the patients that I was taking care of, they often had a lot of anger or a lot of frustration, a lot of anxiety, um, and they didn't really understand how, why they were feeling like that. They often felt like they were letting those around them down, um, but they weren't able to kind of control their actions sometimes or control how they were feeling. Uh, and when I started screening for ACEs, it was to help young people understand, hey, you've been through a lot. You've experienced some, some trauma that, you know, a lot of people your age have not experienced or that it was very difficult for you to handle. And we know that the science tells us that when you experience that trauma or very frequently or severe trauma at a young age, that it can really impact kind of how your brain works, how your stress hormones react in your body and can make you feel some of the things that you're feeling. And at that time when I was screening for ACEs, it would be very often that patients would be literally crying in my office because they started to have an aha moment and they started to feel like, hey, I understand a little bit better about how I'm feeling this way. 
you know, it's not my fault, some of the things that I'm feeling and some of the things that I'm doing. And for me, it really improved the therapeutic relationship um, and really helped uh, patients make that step of saying, okay, I understand what you're saying. Now, how can we get better? How do we treat this? And so I think even when I was, you know, less comfortable and less knowledgeable around what to do with the positive A screening, I was always struck by how it allowed me to open the door and improve the therapeutic relationship uh, with my patients and, and their families. Next slide. <clears throat> and I won't go too in depth about this today, but just to say this is really the anchor um, of our clinical response to a positive ACE screening in clinic. And so these are the stress busters, which are evidence-based interventions to mitigate the toxic stress response. And so a lot of what we do is help clinical teams understand or work on how they can utilize these strategies listed here to respond to someone who's at high risk of toxic stress um, in their clinic. And it seems really simple, I think, on this uh, wheel here, um, but there's a lot of challenges, I think, to implementing these. We understand those. And also, I think that providers have various uh, levels of comfort around talking to their patients about these interventions, but also tying these interventions to treating of, of the dysregulation of the, of the toxic stress response, right? So an example of that would be maybe you have someone in the clinic who has poorly controlled asthma, who has um, obesity or they're overweight and have had troubles um, addressing that and may have some behavioral health issues as well many other issues that we listed on this slide. So what we really work with clinical teams to do is understand how you can connect with that patient on implementing these stress busters, but how you can also make that connection for that patient and that family, uh, that what we're doing is we're using these to treat the dysregulation of the stress response. And through treating the dysregulation of the stress response system, um, that we hope to see the asthma improve, to see some of the behavioral health issues to improve, and really to see all of our ACE-associated health conditions um, improve. And so we have a lot of resources uh, on our website and work with clinics uh, a lot on this issue. We have a, a five-hour course um, that's broken off into little modules that kind of help clinical teams understand how they can implement these in clinical settings um, and really look, look for it, forward to the opportunity uh, to work with providers in different settings to implement these in their clinical setting. Next slide. So I talked about ACEs uh, AWARE's clinical recommendations and kind of the clinical response. So what do we do clinically um, when we have a positive ACE screen or we have a patient that's impacted by uh, toxic stress physiology? But I just wanna call out that we also recognize uh, that no single sector or category of prevention or treatment is sufficient uh, in achieving our goals of preventing ACEs and, and reducing uh, toxic stress uh, in both now and in the future. And so I focus on the clinical setting, but we know that the science of ACEs and toxic stress uh, applies in healthcare and public health and social services and early childhood education and justice, really any place that interfaces with young people and that there is a role for each of these sectors to play in preventing ACEs, but also recognizing and responding to the symptoms of ACEs and toxic stress. Next slide. <clears throat> and in California, there is a lot of that work happening. Oh, we can go back. So in California, there's a lot of the, that work happening. I'm talking here about ACEs AWARE, which is really focused on the gray here. So ACE screening and clinical response, uh, early identification and early intervention uh, for toxic stress. There's also a fair amount of research on biomarkers and different type of physiological responses in terms of toxic stress uh, physiology. There's work being done to develop and sustain trauma-informed networks of care. Um, there's cross-sector training and collaboration that's happening, public awareness and education, and some policy changes related to ACEs and toxic stress. And there's examples that we have for each one of these, um, but I wanted to highlight two of them that I think were really salient uh, for school-based health centers um, and the, and the uh, adolescents and children that we're talking about today. Next slide. So the first is a public awareness campaign, which is the Live Beyond campaign. Uh, and the Live Beyond campaign is really exciting because it's one of the only campaigns that I'm aware of that really targets youth and young people 
um, to educate them about the impact of ACEs and toxic stress uh, how and how they can heal uh, from toxic stress physiology. Next slide. And what's more important, I, th I think what's, what's more important than the target uh, of the Live Beyond campaign uh, is the work that the Live Beyond campaign has done to include young people. So Live Beyond campaign, the Live Beyond campaign has made efforts to center youth and young adults in their campaign development uh, from start to finish. Uh, and they worked with youth and young adult advisors uh, from a diverse group of young people um, that were uh, from all areas of the state. Uh, we can see here that 19% self-identify as non-binary, gender non-conforming. Um, we see the, the, the different races and ethnicities that were involved and different representations of, of different counties um, across California. So I think what's really exciting about the Live Beyond campaign is the work that they've done with young people to have this really be a campaign that is developed by a diverse group of young people in California and is really targeting a diverse group of young people in California. Next slide. And this is just some examples of the campaign materials. The campaign was brought to life through commercials, testimonial videos, radio ads, digital ads, social media marketing, and much more. Uh, many of it is seen here. Uh, you may have seen um, some of this material um, either in billboards or listen to, to the Spotify, for example. And for those uh, who have not seen it, encourage you all to go to livebeyondca.org where you can see a lot of the toolkits and a lot of the resources um, that have been developed and a lot of the testimonials that have been developed. So uh, this campaign is, is, is really powerful and again, targeted towards uh, uh, young people and developed by young people. Next slide. Another example is uh, the, some of the cross-sector training that we have. And so this is the safe spaces um, curriculum. Um, and this is a training about the impact of uh, ACEs and adversity um, on learning and on brain development, and is really designed to give er early child care professionals and, and educators K through 12 um, the tools to kind of identify and respond uh, to the impact of ACEs uh, and toxic stress in educational settings. So the QR code is not showing up here, but you can go to training.acesaware.org and see the safe spaces curriculum that's really broken down into uh, age groups. So you have like age zero to five and you have older five to 11 and then uh, our adolescent age group. So another, this is an example of that cross sector training and collaboration that's happening. Next slide. And again, going back to no single sector category is a prevention or treatment is sufficient alone. I'm just really excited to have the opportunity to think about how to do this work well in school-based health centers. Next slide. Um, missing a slide here, but was just want to call out that ACE is aware um, has worked with the California School-Based Health Alliance and the organization ETR to publish a, a kind of a white paper on the role of school-based health centers um, in screening for ACEs and toxic stress and really learn more about the unique barriers, but more importantly, the unique opportunities of doing this work with school-based health centers and understanding that school-based health centers are really well positioned to do this work. And we're really looking to, forward to working with school-based health centers to learn how to do this work well in this setting um, and support you all and the needs that you have in, in, in a screening and response. And just wanted to end um, with some additional resources. Um, so this is our uh, core training link. So in California, clinical providers who screen for ACEs can receive a $29 reimbursement uh, for ACE screening. Um, to be eligible to receive that reimbursement, you have to complete the core training. Um, and that link is here. Next slide. In addition to our core training, we have over 100 hours of training content. We're constantly developing more. Um, all of our trainings are free, open to everyone, and eligible for various um, CME and continuing education credits. And so that can be found at training.acesaware.org. Next slide. And then just have more resources for the clinical response. So here I talked about earlier our um, stress buster course um, that talks about how to implement this in uh, various settings and a lot of other patient tools and patient handouts on kind of how to manage a, a chronic or toxic stress physiology. Um, next slide. 
And if anybody has any questions about ACES Aware or what we talked about here, feel free to reach out to us at questions at ACES Aware. And with that, I'll pass it back over to Amy. Thank you so very much. That was really, really helpful. I really, um, one of the things that stood out from what you had to say is your experience as a clinician and how doing a screening and response has helped you really strengthen that therapeutic response with the, the folks that you're working with. Um, that's really powerful. Um, so we are going to transition just to talk a little bit more about ACE screening and school-based health centers. With schools serving as an accessible and trusted point of contact for students, school-based health centers are well positioned to identify, prevent, and respond to ACEs. We'll discuss the opportunities and benefits of ACE screening and response in school-based health centers and also discuss some of the challenges that school-based health centers might face. So we all know that schools are central to students' lives and they now serve as vital hubs for identifying and addressing mental and physical health needs. School staff and school health partners are often the first to notice signs of mental health challenge and can connect students the, to the appropriate school-based services which can be especially important for those who might otherwise struggle to access care in their communities. For many children and adolescents, school-based health centers are a lifeline, providing critical health services directly where they are needed most. So given their unique position within schools, school-based health centers are ideal settings for ACE screenings. And here's a little bit of why, accessibility. Students spend much of their time at school, so making school-based health centers easily accessible um, for routine checkups, for follow-ups, and for screenings. And this really increases the likelihood that they'll receive timely care. Integrated care. School-based health centers often have multidisciplinary teams that include medical, mental health, and support staff. These teams collaborate, ensuring that students receive comprehensive care that addresses both their physical and their emotional health needs. They're trusted. School-based health centers benefit from the trust that students and their families have in school staff, enabling really stronger engagement with the school-based health center. Families are often more willing to seek help from a provider within a familiar school environment than from an external uh, healthcare facility. And the opportunity for care coordination through the frameworks like the multi-tiered system of support, MTSS, school-based health centers are positioned to collaborate with schools to provide prevention, early intervention, and more intensive supports when needed. So let's just take a closer look at some of these benefits that I've mentioned. Convenient and ongoing access. So school-based health centers eliminate common barriers to care, such as transportation, such as cost, scheduling. Being on-site means students can access care more regularly, allowing for ongoing monitoring and timely follow-up visits which is really essential when addressed, uh, addressing ACEs and toxic stress. It also means less out of school time for students. Multidisciplinary teams and existing support systems. So school-based health centers often feature diverse teams of healthcare professionals, medical providers, mental health clinicians, nurses, health educators, who are typically in close communication with school staff. This, this teamwork really means that a screening can identify a need and the necessary supports are, might already exist and can be accessed. And there are opportunities to really expand these supports if needed. Strong provider student relationships. Um, the school environment fosters trust, which is really key to a effective a screening. Students are more likely to open up to a provider when they feel they have familiarity and in a setting where they feel safe and supported. The ongoing presence of health staff within schools also helps reduce the stigma that can be associated with seeking out mental health support. 
trauma-informed care, many school-based health centers already operate under a trauma-informed care framework, which makes them equipped to address the impacts of ACEs on both health and behavior. They're also really designed to meet the cultural linguistic needs of the communities that they serve, um, which is really critical in reducing disparities in access. And finally, financial sustainability. Um, SBHCs can benefit financially from ACE screenings as each screening is reimbursed. I believe it's $29, but tell me if I'm wrong, Makai, um, which is outside of a typical FQHC reimbursement rate. Um, this additional revenue stream can really support the expansion of ACE screening and trauma-informed care practices which really ultimately helps with sustainability. So, you know, I just wanna specifically in terms of youth mental health, I wanna emphasize what we know about the benefits of school-based health centers and school-based behavioral health support. So here's some of the statistics, right? 70 to 80% of children and adolescents who receive mental health services access these services at school. Um, youth are six times more likely to complete evidence-based treatment in a school setting versus a community-based setting. So you can see this is really impactful data. And there's also benefits around the relationships. School-based settings provide mental health professionals easy access to educators. And they, those educators report both increased ability to respond appropriately when students are in distress and build better relationships. Um, and also just that relationship piece that Dr. Owen spoke about, higher quality relationships with adults has been linked to reduce mental health distress for youth and is a protective factor against suicide. So all of this speaks to why ACE screening and response in school settings can be so powerful and really provide support and intervention for students who need it in a setting um, where it can make a big difference for them. And the data really supports this. Um, but screening goes beyond a simple questionnaire or a screening tool that we might offer to students. It's really about creating a trauma-informed environment where students feel supported and understood. Um, the trauma-informed care emphasizes safety, trustworthiness, collaboration, empowerment, and really it also can focus on cultural, historical, and gender considerations as well. So again, school-based health centers are well positioned to meet this need as they already prioritize building trust with students, with families, through ongoing care, with, through tailored services, and often have a trauma-informed framework. However, implementing a screening comes with real challenges that we need to consider. One of those is limited resources. Not all school-based health centers have the capacity to address the full range of needs identified by ACE screenings. Truly, not many settings are able to address the full range of needs. And a shortage of behavioral health providers um, or lack of appropriate cultural um, community resources for addressing social drivers of health can really create some barriers to providing more comprehensive care. So there can be hesitance um, to ask questions about ACEs if we don't have, quote unquote, a solution. Um, and that's related to managing high ACE scores. There is a concern that identifying a high ACE score could, as some have called it, open a can of worms or have some kind of unintended consequences. For example, concern that it might potentially make that student feel stigmatized or that it could undermine the trust between the provider and the patient, or it could trigger mandatory CPS reports. Um, so addressing these concerns is really part of preparation for a screening in school-based health centers and requires careful planning and support and training. Screening fatigue is also another challenge. Uh, many school-based health centers already use multiple screening tools for various health and behavioral issues. So adding an ACE screening can feel like an additional burden leading to more screening fatigue. So really this, this just speaks to how critical it is to integrate ACE screenings in a way that can complement the existing assessments without overwhelming staff or students. 
Um, time constraints are also another barrier. Uh, many school-based health centers offer on a reimbursement model that emphasizes billable visits. So this can make it difficult to invest time in implementing new workflows and doing staff training, developing partnerships that are essential to providing trauma-informed care. It could also put pressure to prioritize billable visits over screenings, over psychoeducation and follow-up. And this is why a billing mechanism for ACE screening exists in really recognizing this fiscal consideration. And another challenge is organizational buy-in. Sometimes school-based health centers are governed by various lead agencies, could be a FQHC, a health department, a community-based organization, and these agencies might have different priorities, which can, can make it more difficult to secure buy-in for new initiatives such as a screening. So aligning goals and demonstrating the value of trauma-informed care and screening are key to overcoming this challenge. So um, given all that you've heard today and given the opportunities and challenges that we've discussed, we wanna offer support for those interested in integrating a screening into your school-based health centers. The California School-Based Health Alliance is launching an ACEs aware learning community for school-based health centers to advance a screening response and trauma-informed care. The learning community will feature a series of webinars, collaborative learning opportunities, and tailored technical assistance. So to be eligible, you need to be a school-based health center that has does Medi-Cal billing, it has Medi-Cal billing providers that provides primary medical care, and is really committed to piloting or launching a screening during this 2024-25 academic year. Um, participating SBHCs will receive up to $10,000 to support these efforts, recognizing that there is a, a, a lift to, to build capacity. Um, and we're really pleased to be able to offer um, financial support. Some of the areas that we're going to dive more deeply as part of the learning community is around trauma-informed practice, around how to clinically respond to students who screen positive for ACEs, um, about more evidence-based resources and patient tools that are helpful to integrate into a school-based health center's clinical response. Um, how to talk with a about ACEs with adolescents. What are youth telling us about what is most helpful and that resonates most with youth? The learning community will be able to include ACEs aware youth advisors in our spaces to really help center youth voice. And really, we'll talk about that value of psychoeducation around ACEs in a really trauma-informed, youth-informed way. So uh, we're going to be dropping, if we haven't already, some uh, links in the chat that have uh, a deeper description of this opportunity. The application is now live. If you're interested, um, you can indicate that. Go to any of these links. You can indicate that in the evaluation survey. Um, and we just hope you'll consider being a part of the initiative to improve a screening and trauma-informed care in school-based health centers. Even if you are not part of the learning community, we will have two more upcoming ACE webinars that we'd love for you to attend where we'll um, continue to deepen our knowledge and understanding. So I'm going to uh, just share with you a few more of CSHA's resources that you can um, take a look at at your leisure. If you're looking for something in particular that you don't find, let us know. Um, and uh, Dr. Owen was re referencing this document, and I moved it in the slide deck, but he was referencing this, which is a report um, that we released where we brought together school-based health folks and ACEs experts to really dive deeply into ACE screening in school-based health centers and offer some recommendations. So that, um, that link is also going to be shared with you. And we have just a couple of minutes to do some Q&A, but we're happy to answer questions. I'm not sure if things have come through the chat that I should be uh, addressing. 
I see a couple of you want me to just jump in? Yeah, please do that since I can't quite see. <laughs> no problem. So I see one that says, uh, I'm curious about activities around ACEs and claims analysis. I imagine health plans in California get a lot of ACE claims data. Do they do anything with the data or are their actions taken mostly happening at the ACE screener practitioner level? So first, that's a, a great question. Um, with ACE is Aware, if you go to aceisaware.org slash, or I'll just put it, um, maybe somebody can drop it in the chat, data reports. Um, we do report on um, a screen, the number of A screenings that have been done um, by county um, when counties have um, reached a certain number of screens. And we do uh, report um, the number of people who have completed um, the training um, by county. Uh, in terms of the rest, there is some things that I think we'll talk about later in the webinar series about how a positive A screen um, can be used for, uh, you know, eligibility criteria for ECM. And so, you know, there are some places that may be looking at the ACE claims data that they have to kind of identify their eligibility for enhanced care management. Um, but also when we think about, if I think I understand what's behind the question as well, when we think about some of the opportunities and what can be done um, with the data, we are very mindful one of making sure that we're always respecting um, confidentiality, um, but also understanding that a screen in California has really taken off. There's been about 3 million screens done, but it's still um, the majority of people in clinical settings have not been screened for ACEs. Um, so we have to be really mindful of um, what data is available and how we may respond. Um, because, you know, for example, there could be a small clinic um, in a community, in, in a county that's, that's screening for ACEs where many other places aren't screening for ACEs. Uh, the youth there may have a high prevalence of uh, four or more ACEs. And we want to be mindful to say, to not say that that is what necessarily is what's going on um, in the county. So there's various other data sources um, like the California Health Interview Survey and some others that uh, can keep in mind to get a fuller picture of, of what may be happening um, in various communities. Um, I saw another one um, in the chat. I'm going to switch over from the Q&A here, which says, in my experience, there's often not a tremendous cultural concordance uh, between BIPOC children with ACEs and the school healthcare systems in which they are embedded. Do you offer tools or strategies for managing iatrogenic systems of care? So also love that question, totally understand um, what you're communicating about cultural concordance. And so we do have a lot of like scripts, a lot of work on trauma-informed care principles, how to communicate about ACE screening, how to respond in a culturally competent way. And we do a lot of work about how to respond directly with um, adolescents and young adults. And so we had a webinar last week on the ACEs Aware platform that's on training.acesaware now. We heard directly from young people, many of who were people of color, um, about how to identify and respond uh, to ACEs and toxic stress, how to communicate uh, to adolescents around ACEs and toxic stress. So I do think we do a fair bit of that and hope to bring um, some more young people to talk to this group or to, to talk in future webinars. And we really hope that that will be a part of the work that we do in this community of practice um, as well. Um, another question, can you share an example of a workflow of how ACEs are administered in schools and how students with positive screeners are referred to mental health and behavioral health services? We often receive resistance from school staff or the district from implementing new projects in schools or having, having a workflow will encourage, convince them. So we have quite a bit of that on training on our, on our website, acesaware.org for clinical settings. Um, so we have a lot about a screening in the clinical uh, setting and what a workflow could look like and how to respond in various referrals. I do think it's a little bit different um, if you are screening outside of like a primary care setting, um, not to say that um, it shouldn't be done there, um, but there are differences. So without knowing more about this question, it's, it's kind of hard to say if we have workflows, but kind of I will say that there may be some people on this call that are interested in potentially screening for ACEs um, in settings other than like a school-based health primary care setting. Um, and if so, uh, please do reach out to us uh, at questions at acesaware.org. We're really interested in learning more about um, how people are doing that and what some recommendations for those workflows could be. And um, would love to work with those on, on kind of exploring that further. 
And Dr. Ryan, maybe this one last question before we close, which is how does this training certification align or compare to mental health first aid? Um, that's a great question. I haven't taken the mental health first aid training um, in, a, in a while, but I, I do think ours is, um, our core training at least is, is, is pretty different in kind of understanding the impact of ACEs and adversity and, and responding with trauma-informed care. I do think in some of our um, supplemental trainings that there is kind of um, a lot more or, or a lot of overlap. And I think one of the things that is unique about kind of our approach or our training is really helping uh, clinicians, community-based organizations, teachers, whoever it is that, that's taking it, kind of be grounded in strategies to treat this toxic stress physiology. And so I think that's not a component of many other trainings, um, but just to understand that toxic stress is a root cause of many mental, behavior, health, physical health conditions, and that we really want to support um, different clinicians or provider types um, in implementing those strategies with, with, with patients and families um, to mitigate toxic stress. Great. Thank you so much. We don't have much more time, but I wanted to wrap us up and again, thank Dr. Owen for his expertise. This is just the beginning. Uh, we're going to be doing a lot more work around ACEs. Please feel free if you have questions that didn't get answered to reach out to us um, and consider participating in our learning community, coming back for more of our webinars. Uh, and just to let you know about what we're doing at CSHA, we have a few upcoming web webinars that we'd love you to register for if you are interested. Uh, the first one is coming up next week on engaging young people as peer educators, specifically TUPI. Um, we have another one in early November on the triangulum of cannabis, tobacco, and e-cigarette use and its effect on physical health, addiction, and mental health in young people. Um, and then in November, we're going to have another webinar, not yet ready to register folks yet, but it's on wellness coaches and SBHCs. So more to come um, on that. Please stay in touch with us. And finally, I will just tell you, to, you know how to reach us. Um, an evaluation will pop up when you log off. So if you can give us another 30 seconds of your time to complete that, we really would love your feedback. Um, about how, you know, what you took away from this session. So thank you so much and have a great rest of your day.